host for this weekly program in which I have the great privilege of introducing to you men and women because of their great love for Christ. And sometimes in different aspects of their journey, you were brought back to Christ and the church. And our guest tonight is Father Tobias Unerstall. And this is one of those programs that at one point we had hoped to film his journey way over in his homeland in Sweden, but he's here in the United States studying. And so we had a great privilege of inviting Father Tobias to join us on the program. He's a former Swedish Lutheran who not only became Catholic, but he's a priest. And he'll talk about that journey in a moment. You're an important, essential part of the program. So if you'd like to call us with a question, you can call us at 1-800-221-9480 or outside North America, 205-271-2980. Or you can write me an email at Marcus, oh, excuse me, <laughs> that's my other email used for my other program, journeyhome at EWTN.com. Father Tobias, thank you for joining us on the Journey Home. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Well, thank you very much. Brought you all the way over the pond so you could join us on the Journey Home. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing here in the States? Let the audience know. I'm working on a dissertation about the nature of the church at Catholic University. About the nature of the church? Yes. What aspect? Ecclesiology. Of okay, great. <laughs> I mean, it's such a, on the one hand, it's such a big question, but uh, it, it's a fascinating question. I know maybe we'll get into it later. Maybe we'll get a phone call on this because there's an also awful lot of people today, Christians, that do not believe the church is necessary. Oh. Just Jesus and me. The church is a man-made thing. So really studying the nature of the church and the importance of the church and the necessity of the church is, I think, at the cutting edge of what people need to hear today, that growing heresy of just Jesus and me. I don't need a church. I don't need sacraments. And so we're glad to have you here. But let me get out of the way. I invite my guests every week to begin by giving us a summary of their spiritual background, if you would. Well, thank you. Well, um, Marcus, you know, Sweden was a country that was only recently Christianized, sort of year 860 or something like that, 860. And for the first six, seven, six, seven hundred years, it was Catholic. There was nothing else that Catholicism around. And then the Reformation came along and broke off much of that cultural um, contact with the rest of Europe that we had had until then. Well, it happened very quickly, too, didn't it? Uh, well, it came quickly. It took some time as a, as a process, almost hundred years before okay. it was really through, actually. The last... Catholic nuns left uh, Sweden in uh, 1599. Mm. And you can still go into that church in Vatstein, a beautiful, enormously beautiful church. And um, today they will tell you the story that the sisters left in 1599, but they won't tell you why they left. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like they rather wanted to go out to buy ice cream or something. I don't mean to interrupt, but did Sweden experience the iconoclasm, the destruction of churches and things in the same way the rest of Europe did? Not the same way. Uh, not so much destruction as they painted them over. But that was later. Okay. Uh, end of 17th century, beginning of 18th century. Okay. And um, now many of those are restored to splendor, okay. must be said. Very so beautiful. that's the beauty of that. Oh, Some yes. of that cultural stuff is still there waiting for us all to see again. Oh, yes. Yeah. We've got lots of medieval churches that are gorgeous to look at and to be in. Okay. Um, however, that meant that the church became a state church. One king, one country, one belief, you know, one faith. And uh, that was very much rig uh, rigorously in employed in the countries. It was even forbidden for people to become Catholics for, it was mm. capital punishment for almost 200 years. Mm. Unlike in England, as you remember, where it was only priests. If, if you were a priest, you, were, you could be okay. killed. But in Sweden, anyone. So oh, only, really? Oh, yes. Because in England, I mean, you were, you were tried, they tried to force you to go to the Anglican worship, That's right. or else you had to be a recusant. But in Sweden, the you could not even remain in Sweden if you were Catholic. You could not. You had to leave. You could, had to leave. Is that true of all the, the Scandinavian countries? I can't answer that, actually. Okay. I can't right. answer that. But for Sweden, it was uh, definitely all right. true. All right. Okay. We, we were very rigorous in these things. <laughs> 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 and and uh, it, well, it really meant that in the end, um, um, it was even that you had a duty by law to be present in your local parish church on Sundays. Mm -hmm. They had a roll call, checking you out, whether you were there or not. 
once a year the uh, Lutheran minister would come along to your house and check whether you know the catechism or not or whether and check particularly check out that no one is uh, leaving the faith or something like that mm -hmm. you had to know it and um, so they made sure you were catechized oh yes you we could say so they were but from above by force yeah. by that power of the state the policeman would come and get you otherwise you know <laughs> all right so in other words people would, would fake it I would have thought so. I don't know. But you have to ask you the question. Because it was lost. I mean, that exactly. was the issue. That was a big thing. All of a sudden, in the this, well, last century, the 20th century, it went, practicing Lutherans went from almost 100% of the, those who were members of the Lutheran Church to, today, I believe, less than half a percent less of their members half. are supposedly regularly participating in, wow. in uh, liturgies or, or any kind. Mm -hmm. And that includes uh, wonderful concerts that they give and call for, for prayer concerts and things like that. Mm. So I grew up in this uh, milieu where I was baptized. Everyone was baptized, basically. Mm. Uh, you were even a member before you were baptized, of course. Everyone born in the country was a member of the Lutheran Church. And I was baptized and knew not, nothing about it. Nothing. Mm. I remember seeing a black and white picture of myself, of baptism, you know, in a strange um, uh, gown, long gown, and my mother or dad, whoever it was, with a couple of people holding me. And I was a bit scared, because somewhere along this black and white picture was this um, strange um, cut, which was actually, I understand there was flowers probably lying there. I didn't know what it was. It looked, it looked dangerous. <laughs> and they told me I was baptized. I didn't know what it was. <laughs> I, st I mean, I still wouldn't have known it today because no one from my family has ever told me what baptism was about. <laughs> did, did you grow up as, for example, in England, many Anglicans grow up with kind of a, a, a really overly positive view of Henry VIII and Elizabeth, kind of a cleaned up oh version. Yes. Did you do the same with the king that brought you into Lutheranism? If you read, when I went to school, the history books would speak about Gustav Vasa as the big father of the country. He was our Henry VIII, right? Mm -hmm. He was our, and he, he um, and in many ways rightly so, because he made it into a nation. Before that, we, uh, politically speaking, we were not quite as uh, sol solid as we became from that time on, mm. which of course was the same in England. Yep. Yep. Uh, uh, and so you grew up with that view yeah. of the church, a positive view, but not really in an oh, no. internal conversion of any sense. No, no, we didn't believe in that. <laughs> In fact, my only contact with church at all was um, a couple of uh, baptism, at least one confirmation, I believe. I was actually chucked out of that one. I was, <laughs> I was a little boy, and it was a bit boring, going on for hours, and I started to, on my knees, uh, sort of uh, crawl around, around the, uh, among the pews, and eventually I had to sit in the car. <laughs> <laughs> so then what happened to your faith? At what point did you pretty well leave it all behind? Yes. Yes, the, um, apart from one summer when I was, I think six, I think it was before first grade, I spent a summer with, uh, because of family reasons, with relatives in the country, my brother as well, and uh, they belonged to the part of the family that actually f practiced their faith. They prayed regularly and so forth, and they taught us to pray an evening prayer, and the Our Father, and on Sundays we were rowing across it is out in the archipelago of Stockholm, mm -hmm. uh, rode across to the, the local Lutheran church for morning, Sunday morning mass. They call it mass, actually. Mm -hmm. There was nothing about the Eucharist in it, though. Mm -hmm. There's lots of lovely hymns. I loved that. <laughs> or I couldn't read, though, so it was... <laughs> so you went there, is, uh, actually had experience of prayer? Yes. The only experience of prayer I can remember from family or so was that summer. It was really nice. I enjoyed that. And then, of course, school came along, and uh, in fifth grade, I think primarily through friends of mine, I was sort of fifth graders, they can be rather opinionated, you know. Uh, and I didn't, I thought, no, oh, that God, that, that's just ridiculous, that's silliness. How can people be, how can people be so stupid? I couldn't believe it. I said, no, that's not on. I'm not going to believe in that. You can do if you want, but for me, that's not it. And um, uh, th there it, we left it at that for several years, you know. Now, let me ask you on that question. In America, <clears throat> even though, I mean, we're the, ma we're the land of the free, which means we're the land of denominations. I mean, a new one starts every five days in America. <laughs> so the number of Christian traditions in America is, <clears throat> I don't know, I hate to say almost infinite, but it's just getting that way. 
to make that kind of statement uh, to believe in God is silliness. Certainly there are many atheists and, and scientific materialists in America, but a pretty strong majority of Americans believe in God. Yes. That, that's what fascinates uh, the Europeans. Yeah. Uh, I tell you, it, I worked for a few years uh, as a director of youth ministry, and I went to many schools during mm. those years. Luther, uh, you know, not Lutheran schools, not Catholic schools, simply public schools, mm. most schools are. And I always had a question to them, and it was, listen guys, how many, if per in percentage, of the world population do you be think believe in God or have a faith? Now, if I ask that in America, I think I will get an, a percentage of 90 or 95 percent from the kids, mm. or perhaps even 98 yeah. percent. Yeah. In Sweden, you will get somewhere between 2 and 8 percent. Really? They don't believe. They think that they are the majority of not believing. <laughs> so when you made that statement <laughs> of your atheistic view, you were really saying the majority opinion of your classmates? Um, the others wouldn't say anything at that time. Okay. They weren't bothered. We, we, we were two or three of it's us. Not even an issue. No, not that. All right. Even not then. to bring up the issue. Not then. All right, so there you are. I mean, you're out there as far from God as, at least in your life, uh, there was no place for God. No. What started awakening you to, to faith again? Well, um, family went through a difficult time in many, several times in my lifetime, but particularly around sixth, seventh grade. Mm. So in seventh grade, I remember I was really in despair. I mean, uh, almost every night crying or things like that. It was a very sad time. And I did remember then that prayer that I had been taught that summer many years ago. And I thought, well, perhaps I could give it a try. You know, just <laughs> test it, try it, try it. And I did. I didn't try the Our Father because, after all, I didn't believe in God, so I didn't dare to do that. But the <laughs> other little evening prayer for children, traditional one, I, I dared to use that. And f through that, I also started to be interested in, hold on, where does this tradition come from? Hmm. Why do people pray? So I started to ask, I started to read a lot. And uh, I was also privileged to travel a little bit with our family um, to southern Europe and to see people of faith and with faith in action, so to speak. So when you saw the, the beautiful architecture in your own country or you visited artwork and things in other countries, you just saw that as a tradition, that's a fascinating idea. How'd they ever get around to, to doing this? Where'd that come from? Yeah, and I also tell you one other thing. I also, at that particular time, got very interested in classical music. And one set of music I really loved was Mozart's Requiem. Hmm. I had no idea what it was about, of course. I didn't know <laughs> what a requiem is. Uh, and I certainly didn't know any Latin. Uh, but the music was stunning. I just loved it. I'd been singing it a little bit, too, in a choir. And I remember I gave a recording of that to a friend of mine, who about the same age, a little bit younger, wh whom I didn't think about it, but he's actually Jewish. And uh, then I realized, when, as I was pursuing, trying to figure <laughs> out what this music was about, I realized perhaps it wasn't the most kindest or perhaps most... Uh, <laughs> politically uh, correct thing to do, uh, although I wouldn't have used that language, of yeah, course, at uh, yeah. 13. But um, that, that triggered mm. the question, what is behind all this beauty? What is behind this text? Why, how can people compose this? How can they build these cathedrals? And I was fascinated by that. All right. So it's a great seed that God uses to open your heart. Yes. What moved you farther? That I'm sure it didn't bring you right into the church, but how did <laughs> that seed get fed so it could awaken but faith? During a trip, uh, I think it was the second time we were in Italy. We had been once and stayed only a couple of weeks, and there we, we made a trip to Rome. I subsequently realized that was during the interregnum between Paul VI and John Paul I. Mm. I had no idea about that, of course, but so it was mm. in 78, in August. And, uh, I, um, uh, and the second trip, we stayed the whole week in Rome, the second year, uh, so it must be in eighth grade. And being the vivid reader I was, I had been reading guidebooks. And one guidebook had been mentioning this, mir this church with the miraculous lady, Our Lady of uh, Miracoloso, or something like that mm -hmm. in Italian. And the story, as I remember it, and I do make that caveat because <laughs> my memory comes and goes, <laughs> was that this Jewish man, Alphonse Ratisbonne, had been waiting outside a church in Rome called Sant'Andrea della Fratte. Uh, it's central Rome, very nice p position mm -hmm. in Rome, 
uh, not too far away from all the places you want to go to. Mm -hmm. And he was waiting for a friend and uh, giving, you know, losing his uh, patience perhaps or wanted to spend his time. He had gone into the church uh, and um, he knew of this picture in there who had the, the um, rumor, the, what's the better word for rumor? Um, the tradition. The tradition of being, uh, ha having converted many people, yeah. um, doing miracles. So he walked in and he tested Our Lady and said, well, because he, he was really an atheist, strong okay, atheist. He was not as, a believing Jew, he was an atheist. Yes, as I remember Jews. it, yes. 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 Right. You had to check that out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I remember it then, at 13, yes. and still, I haven't checked it again. But it touched me, and he had anyway. So he tested our lady. He said, well, you try with me. Ha, 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 no chance, you know. A year later, he was baptized. And as far as I understand, he later on founded a, an order to go back, a religious order, to go back to, uh, to um, the Holy Land and c convert uh, Jewish people to mm. the Christian faith, to mm. Catholicism. He so became a priest. So you visited that church? So I visited that. I thought, well, let's have a go. Let's try this. You know, it's like miracle, sort of almost like magic sort of thing. <laughs> so I walked in, I sneaked in, I asked, uh, you know, are European parents a little bit less uh, rigid on keeping track of their children are all the time. <laughs> so I was allowed to walk around. So I walked into this church and I came in. It was an odd feeling. It's rather narrow, and it's not a narrow, it's rather open, but long church, mm. and dark. It was only lit up on one side altar with this not particularly beautiful picture uh, of Our Lady. I, I can't say it is beautiful. I still don't think it's very beautiful. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. And he's got a crown over it and stars and all that. And I was mystified because I wasn't the only one there. There was a whole group of people in front of, of this chapel too, and they were mumbling and mumbling and... There was like one person saying, and the rest answering, and then one saying, and everyone, I now know, of course, they were praying the rosary. <laughs> but you didn't know Italian. I had no idea what the rosary was, and I didn't know Italian, so I have no idea what they were doing. <laughs> I was scared. But I thought I still had to do this. I still had to test this. I stood at the very back, opposite the figure, uh, the picture, and I did sort of repeat uh, Rattus Burns' words, well, you try with me, and I sneaked out again, and forgot all about it, forgot all about it. Mm -hmm. However, somehow, I almost had to go to the very end of that story, uh, many years later, when I, in 1996-98, uh, was studying in Rome for my licentiate at the Gregorian, and uh, a Danish, and I was a priest uh, since four or five years, yeah. And a Danish layperson asked me to come to this shrine of Our Lady to say Mass. And I said, sure, I'd do that. I'd love to do that. It was either that to come celebrate, uh, you know, it's much nicer to go to a shrine. Uh, we were late, so we came in through the back door, uh, straight into the sacristy, and I vested and we got the chalice and started walking out, and I recognized myself. <laughs> And I recognized this picture, and I did remember that I once put her... You, had, you had no idea you're walking into the same church. Then. No. That's neat, yeah. the way God works. Yeah. So you, you, you put the, the old Bible image, you put the fleece out, mm -hmm. you know, Gideon's fleece, you had said to Our Lady, you challenged her, not really expecting anything, no. and forgot about it. What happened then? Yeah, what happened? <laughs> I, for a couple of years, two or so, I was actually rather active in the Lutheran church. I was confirmed in the Lutheran local parish. And I would say, I'm not 100% sure about this, but I was probably one of the few, if not the only one, who at the confirmation service actually had some kind of faith already. <coughs> I don't think anyone or the rest, they were doing it. They were, one was going to get a motor uh, bike oh, and the other one, you know, lots kind of, of nice... rite of passage. Yes, yeah, it's it's a, a that sort of thing. Yeah. And, um, uh, but I did, and... I found there a great, it was wonderful, I liked that years, and I got in together with some high church Lutherans in Sweden, nice people, very mm -hmm. nice people. They had, uh, they gathered once a year to glorious days or liturgies in the big cathedral of Uppsala, mm -hmm. and, uh, but just once a year. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I participated in that, and through it was actually um, asked to start to sing in the Jesuit Parish Choir Church in Stockholm. 
mysterious ways. You know, <laughs> I was simply sitting next to the director of it, who still, um, who actually just converted this year. Really? Yes, he was then the Lutheran. He's now just this year was receding to the church. Sounds like another program. Oh yes, <laughs> he's a great organist, wow. great organist, and we. Um, he said, well, twice, come along, come to sing, because he had heard my voice, I thought that was okay, and he needed more basses in his choir, and that came, so I came twice a week to the Catholic Church, Friday, Monday, Wednesday night for practice, Saturday morning for Mass, to sing for two years. Meanwhile, I was still involved with the high church Lutherans, huh. and, and um, found what happened was there really, what I noticed in the Catholic Church, one, had the Eucharist every Sunday, in those days, yeah. the Lutheran State Church of Sweden had it maximum once a month. Very few had more than once a month, if even that. Yeah. The rest of the time, they call it even, they had something called High Mass without Eucharist. That was a normal thing. And then they had once a month High Mass with a, they would actually call it the Lord's Sacred Supper, oh. which is rather nice. Yeah. So you were going to both then? Yes. Right. Yes. So, at what point did you get drawn over to the Catholic side? I mean, what, was there some particular <coughs> incident or moment that you realized? No, it was long more like a process okay. for me. Uh, one thing was this, hold on, I really liked that with the Eucharist. I found it to treasure it. I didn't know the full theology of it yeah. yet. Who knows the full theology of <laughs> it? Um, but uh, I, I, I'd come to treasure it. And it wasn't possible to get in, uh, frequently in the Lutheran Church. And I thought that was odd. Mm. Hold on, what is this kind of a church that doesn't do the most, most central part of the, of, of the faith regularly? Yeah. Or at least not often. Mm. I mean, once a year is irregular, I suppose, but you know, <laughs> once more often. Uh, so that was very important. And considering talking with other people, particularly one person, still is a Lutheran minister, by the way, and he, he was long late into the night discussing, and don't ask me to remember what we discussed. Yeah. But I do remember I said, this is the faith, and he said, no, this is the faith of our church. And I said, no, this is it. And we were arguing all night long, like teenagers can do. And he persuaded me, yeah, he was right. That is the faith of your church, but it's not my faith. Mm -hmm. So I felt a little bit sort of homeless for a while, and didn't immediately recognize the fact that I actually were already at home. I, I was in the Catholic Church every once Wednesday and every Sunday, and I went I was free, more frequently there than anywhere else, and finally I had to understand, to get over my pride, mm -hmm. because that was, became part of it now. Mm -hmm. Pride that, you know, it's also cultural belonging, all yeah. these people that I started to get to know in the Lutheran Church now, the last couple of years, mm -hmm. and was expecting me to stay there and be there, you know, strong man eventually, mm -hmm. and uh, I couldn't be that. What about your discernment for priesthood? At what point did that start? Oh, yes. So well, you're drawn to the church, you realize you're home, but at some point... Well, yes. I mean, our Lady must have been involved in that, I'm sure, because so many times in my life, at a crucial moment, I <laughs> re retrospectively understood that she was involved. <laughs> but uh, that, that is uh, in hindsight, but what I was thinking of what happened. Well, I would say, um, I really want to become a diplomat. I wanted to become a diplomat. That was a great thing, I thought. I was impressed by your uh, Secretary of State, uh, Henry Kissinger. Mm. He was always on the fr front page in those days, you know, it was yeah. Vietnam, Korea, all, Cuba, all sorts of things. And he was always having all glittering parties and all the lovely flashes, <laughs> you know, and cocktails in his hands. And I thought, wow, he's jet setting around the world and saving the peace. That's great. And gets to parties too. I want to do that. <laughs> uh, and um, I was hoping to eventually get into the School for Foreign Affairs in Stockholm, but uh, God wanted differently. <laughs> I suddenly realized the shallowness of my arguments. Mm. I mean, I'm not saying that diplomats are shallow. I say that my reasons wanted to become one. The things you were focusing on. Oh, yes. They were, you know, it was front page rather than, than the hard work that it entails. And then starting to think, hold on. Who knows how long I'm going to live on this planet? I want to do something that I know is going to have an effect. It's going to not be useless. It's going to be useful. Mm. And um, with much thinking, much praying, 
uh, I've left out a big bit sure. of this, of course, uh, to, but instrumental for becoming a Catholic uh, or uh, was a priest, a Jesuit priest in Stockholm. Mm. And I thought, well, he's done a very good thing for me. Well, if I can do anything like that for one person in my life, I will have done something that is worth living for. That's a good reason to give I, yourself uh, to Christ and to the priesthood. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can I ask how your family felt about your journey? As long as you don't ask me to quote them directly, because right. they use bad language. My <laughs> dad did anyway. <laughs> 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 well, it was. Well, I became uh, th when I became a Catholic. They were they were rather interesting. All sorts of uh, members of the family actually turned up for it. Uh, even the oldest sort of uh, uncle. Um, they didn't stay for the little reception afterwards, but they, uh, I remember one aunt or uh, in-law aunt saying to me, I always wanted to become a Catholic too. I didn't die because of the family. <laughs> and there were many, I think at least five of my uh, relatives said, said that. that. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Yes. So the fields are ripe for harvest there. We just got to give them some courage. Courage, that's. <laughs> 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 yeah, that, and then, then when I decided to become a priest, it was slightly different. Um, the family had actually, we have every year we can watch on state television the Midnight Mass of the Pope, and they watched that. But I was going to go to Midnight Mass in the parish, and just before going I said, and by the way, I'm leaving in the fall to become a priest. <laughs> and then I left. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't hear all that language as you're running down the street. Uh, <laughs> 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 all right, we're going to take a break. We'll come back in a moment with your questions and emails for Father Tobias. See you in a bit. Welcome back to The Journey Home. Our guest tonight is Father Tobias Unerstall, and it's great to have you with us. It's always hard to con condense an entire life. <laughs> and, and, and as you said, sometimes it's only with hindsight that we actually see the way that God touched us at a time when we were blind to it at the time. Um, and, you know, sometimes, w even when I've had other guests <coughs> give their story, sometimes they're they, they can remember every apologetic argument that turned their heart. Now, it's, it's, that's a long time ago. How do you remember all those things? So that's one of the reasons we have phone calls and emails, is they can, they can kind of go back to your story and, and say, what about that moment? So we've got our first caller from, this is, uh, I think it's Michael or Michelle in New York. Hello, are you there? Hello. That's Welcome. Michael. Hello, Michael. What's your question for us tonight? Uh, thank you, Marcus. Uh, my question is to Father Tobias. Could he comment on Queen Christina's conversion to Catholicism and what effect that might have had on the Swedish people? Thanks, Mike. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for the qu question. Um, I, I wasn't alive at the time uh, when Queen Christina uh, converted, so I wouldn't know of the people then uh, how it affected them. But I know uh, in, in, um, in our history uh, books, when I w went to school and so forth, Queen Christina was seen a little bit like a traitor. Uh, mm -hmm. The one who sort of left, you know, her father was a great um, defender of the Lutheranism. He was the first ca king in Sweden that was actually was a Lutheran. All the others had been bad Catholics or Calvinists. Uh, but I he actually was absolutely steeped in Lutheranism as they understood it then. And he fought the Thirty Year War. And here she comes along because he had no, no son. She became the queen and she leaves the faith. Uh, and the country, of course, she had to abdicate. It was, of course, astonishing. It was great propaganda uh, w um, uh, for for the ca for the papists, as they co we are called, <laughs> were called, and it was, of course, an enormous loss for, uh, in many ways, for 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 for, um, for the country, for the Lutheran Church in Sweden. Hmm. When she had to abdicate from yes. the church. But there's another example of how the history is painted a certain way. And people become 
bad people in the history of a co because they don't go with the party line. That's kind of like Mary Queen of Scots in England. That's right. You know, it's the same issue there uh, in a way, depending on whose side of the history you learn. Always the case, and, and you can see that particularly in in, in uh, those two, three hundred years right after the Reformation. You know, so when you were growing up, did was a part of your history include some of the great Catholic saints of the past in Swedish history? Did you learn about Saint Ansgar? He was the one who came in the ninth century from England okay. to bring Christianity to us, and the way we were told it all was that um, he came. And uh, he formed the church in Sweden, and and um, then, of some reason, 500 years later, it was a very bad church around in Sweden. It was a Catholic church, but Luther came with the light again, and they see they really wanted to show that this was the same church. Continuity. Yeah. They want to make some continuity, yeah. which is which is why, for example, in England, they paint the picture that the church before Henry VIII was in horrible need of renewal. Right. Which and it wasn't. Which it wasn't at all. No. That's exactly right. Let's take our next our email. This comes from James, and he writes, Dear Marcus and Father Tobias, what is the difference between the Lutheran teaching of consubstantiation and the, and the Catholic teaching of transubstantiation? What's the significant difference? And he goes on, what is the best way to evangelize current Protestant sects that believe in only a symbolic presence of Christ in the Eucharist, or as they call it, the Lord's Supper? And by the mm -hmm. way, welcome home, he writes. Thank you very much. Well, um, that it was explained to me uh, once that for um, for a, the Lutheran a Lutheran idea, I'm saying a Lutheran idea of the real presence or a presence of Christ in in the Eucharistic species would be this: that yes, um, something happens. Here, at the, when we're celebrating the Lord's Supper, uh, and it is truly um, divine origin, it's truly um, um, uh, the Lord's uh, um, presence. However, it's only the presence for he who believes. So, and it's only presence for he who believes and eats. So, it is there to be eaten, it's there to be drunk. And if you don't do that, there's not that presence at all. Now, of course, our idea uh, is slightly different, as you <coughs> might well know. We're thinking of um, the presence, the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, e Eucharistic species as something that's objectively there. There's nothing to do with my belief about it at all, or your belief, or whether, indeed, not even um, in certain circumstances, whether you eat it or not. Uh, that's why we have, can have Eucharistic adoration, as we can preserve, as has been done since the very beginning of, of the Church, preserve the Blessed Sacrament f for the sick, so that they can uh, get nourishment uh, uh, and, uh, and also for prayer. In that sense, uh, from a Catholic perspective, our belief in it affects what we receive, what we receive from the partaking of the our belief in that. Yeah. It doesn't affect the Eucharist, though. Oh, no, no, no. But oh, it no. might affect what we benefit oh, oh, from. That's definitely. the difference here. Oh, definitely. In the Lutheran perspective, it not only affects whether we, what we benefit from, I was brought up Lutheran, whether or not we, we, we benefit from it, but whether it is real or not depends on the believer. But I heard this. There was a, it was a German bishop, an uh, evangelical Landesbischof, as they're called there, in German, uh, he uh, Lutheran, and he said to me, "Well, you see, if we, he believed in the re real presence. He said it's there in the tabernacle. However, if we send it out in in a, one of those space shuttles, it stops being there because it cannot conceivably ever be consumed. Yeah. Hence, it's not anymore. It never presence. really changes. That's right. That's really what the issue is here. All right, fine. Let's go to Mary in New Jersey. Hello. What's your question for us today? Hi, Marcus. Good evening, and good yes. evening, Father. Uh, my question, uh, Father Tobias, may seem a bit uh, personal, if you will, I, I apologize, but uh, I'm fascinated by your story of a process um, in your uh, belief. Uh, but I, I wonder, to go from unbelief to belief, I, I feel requires a personal touch from God, if you will, a kind of uh, moment of grace. Uh, and I would ask if you would describe that moment of grace that took you from 
unbelief to belief. And I'll just hang up and listen. Thank okay. you very much. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Um, obviously, I think that every moment of our lives is full of a gr moment of grace. It's a question of whether I will recognize this grace or not. Will I recognize that God is working in my life or not? That he's already reaching out to me, trying to find me, and I'm sort of looking the other direction? Or is, am I going to do that metanoia, that turning around, that conversion, and say, oh, there you are. Why, where have you been all my life? <laughs> where have you been here? And, and, and receive him and be glad and happy and live that life, of full life of faith that, that that entails. Now, for me, I must admit, I cannot say there was one specific moment that I felt that this is the moment when I do this. But I do say, I suppose the time you could say is that the first time I, I uh, w when I started to read about uh, uh, the faith and trying to figure out more about the background of all these beautiful uh, bu buildings and music and uh, texts, not to mention the text, and also reading the Gospels, particularly St. John's Gospel, mm. and I must emphasize chapter 6, <laughs> which, uh, which has to do with the Eucharist very much, um, uh, partio, all exegetes, but it has, and, and uh, that felt made a moment I had to say to others, you know, um, I, I think there's something in this. Uh, and I, I, I believe in this. And it wasn't just one morning I woke up and think, f saying that, but it was really that process of perhaps I was studying this book, I got the Bible here, uh, so, sort of um, more like an interested intellectual first. We must know about our cultural heritage. But finally I realized that this book and this church belong together and it was a life to be lived in this. All right, thank you, Father. Let's take our next email from Judy. She writes, good evening, I love your show. I have never been in to Europe, but <coughs> understand that very few are remaining Catholic in Europe. Do you think America is in danger of the same thing? And what should be done to keep American Catholics faithful to their religion? Thank you, Judy. Well, first of all, her, her, her reflection on the, the state of the church in Europe. Right. Um, I'm not quite as pessimistic as some are. I, I, part of my nature, perhaps, uh, perhaps because I lived most of my Catholic life uh, under the pontificate of John Paul II. Mm. Uh, but I've seen so many young people in Europe that really embrace the faith. I've seen the Catholic Church in countries such as Germany turn from really sad state when everything was uh, problematic. That means problematic, or difficult, schwierig and so forth. And you could walk in, in the 1980s, you could walk into a, a, a bookshop and there were rows up on rows and rows on, on the problems of the church. The ch church must renew itself, become more modern and all that sort of stuff. And I've seen that church change to, for today when there's lots of optimism, lots of love for the Eucharist, lots of love for the Blessed mm -hmm. Mother, lots of love for the church in, in herself. And you, you now go to the bookshops in, in, in Germany and you, you find lots and lots of books on spirituality, on prayer, on traditional things uh, of, of the church, which is, uh, so I, I'm optimistic. And so turn to your second question about America. Uh, America. You know, I only lived here for, uh, for, I was supposed to live here for two years to do my doctorate, and I'm here in August, it'll be four years. Uh, I'm a bit slow learner. <laughs> Okay. Well, you had some that, that also slowed you up, too, because you were supposed to be on this program before, but you, you broke your leg, right? You yeah. Had a bit of an accident, uh, so a little delay. That's a nice excuse, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I did break my femur in February, but that, that's not why I'm so slow. <laughs> but what the thing that struck me and struck any um, European coming to this country is the, the, uh, the strong, vibrant faith there is present among people, particularly among the lay people. The lay people here are wonderful. I can't say anything else. Uh, they are just great. They're keeping us priests, uh, you know, alert to want to, and also supporting very well. I, 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 first time I came as a priest to the United States, I worked a month in Massachusetts, of all places. And, you know, the first things that happened is that this lady came up to me and said, Oh, Father, a little place, a little small town outside Worcester, and said, I'm so sorry, Father, we have Eucharistic adoration in the church. Um, but we only can do it uh, Monday through Friday. <laughs> we haven't got more than 200 people who participate in the program or something <laughs> like that. And, 
just to hear this from somebody was uh, marvelous. I think the way forward for the church is always to be clear. To clear the teaching doesn't mean to be, to be um, mechanical. It's not the same thing. I always meet people where they are and try to bring them from where they are to where God wants them to be, for hopefully. Mm-hmm. Uh, with questions, with the doubts, with the wrestlings with the faith and all that sort of things. But be clear, well, you know, this is, this is mm-hmm. the full gospel. My bishop often says about the Catholic Church in Sweden that our task is to be the guardians or the protectors of the fullness of the gospel. Not just one little piece of it here, another piece there, which I, in one sense, uh, without being demeaning, with, with one sense characterize sects, yeah. that they uh, find one thing so important that everything else will have to fall aside or be set, be set aside. Yeah. Now, the Catholic Church is about the fullness of the faith, the fullness of the gospel. Thank you, Father. Excellent. Let's go to our next caller, Dan from Virginia. Hello, Dan. What's your question for us? Uh, hi. Uh, I, I think you kind of addressed that, uh, my question a little bit, uh, but you know, we hear so much about the decline of the Catholic Church in Europe, and I was just wondering in Sweden, is it the, uh, would you say the percentage of, of Catholics there is a predominant church, or is it, and is it in decline, or is it rising? Thanks, Dan. There have been some conversions, uh, quite notably, in the last couple of years, I know that. Yes, we do have one or there are prominent converts coming along, as it's called, you know, famous people. Mm-hmm. Um, the Swedish Academy, which was founded in, uh, is there to safeguard their language or to promote the good Swedish, founded in the 1700s by our king, uh, on the lines of, um, it's a very fine institution in a way. They have 18 lifelong members, and I think three or four of them now are Catholics. Hmm. And so uh, our old bishop is now emeritus, retired. He used to say that the Catholic Church is always overrepresented overrepres- everywhere. He said it's overrepresented in, the, in Sweden, in the Swedish Academy, and in the prisons. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, however, I would like to say this. Um, the state of the Church in Sweden right now, the Catholic Church, we are a very small minority, very small and it has been for a long time. We only, we say we're about 2% of the population. There might actually be 4% that we don't know who they are. Hmm. Lots of immigrants from all over the world uh, who do not dare to register. They're afraid for various reasons to get their names into anything of authority because they're not there legally, because they're not of other reasons. They're, they simply won't get into the system. So we don't know their names, we don't know who they are. It's very difficult to, to minister to them and with them. Um, another struggle we have is uh, recently with an awful lot of people from uh, I- Iraq right. and, and, and the Middle East, but particularly Iraq. As, uh, Chaldean Christians, they are Catholics. I mean, they are... Uh, uh, and and um, we don't have priests who speak both Swedish and their languages. Mm. We have a few who have come and the young ones, they're learned, but they're so overstressed in their work. There's so many new ones coming all the time. So that's part of our struggle that, yes, there are lots of young people, lots of them from uh, other countries. Um, now the, and that is one specific challenge. The second challenge, which is even worse, I think, because that we can deal with. It needs a little bit of money, a little bit of uh, patience, a little bit of organization. The second challenge is, of course, second or third generation immigrants. And they, if they remain in the church, if they remain married in the church, if they raise their children in the church or not, that is, mm. if the church cannot pass on the faith, which is tradition, is to, tradi- to, to give it on, hand on the faith, uh, we have a tra- problem. At the moment, not doing very well, but not doing very badly either. Um, it, uh, but we certainly have something to work on there, uh, and yeah, hmm. I think that's... A couple questions with that. Number one, I had heard that a high percentage of the present priests in Sweden are all converts. Not true. Okay. Uh, a high percent of the Swedish-born priests are converts. Okay, okay. That's true. Okay. Uh, we are a small diocese, we count... Which would make sense, because they would have been born Lutheran, They would have been. Likely. Yes, most likely. Uh, we have, at the moment, I think, only one, two... Or three, or three, or possibly four Swedish-born Catholic priests in the country. And that counting the uh, religious, wow. yeah, uh, that were born uh, yeah. uh, uh, and they were Catholics uh, as cradle Catholics. Yeah. 
the rest of them are converts like are myself. Convert like yourself. And what about the state of uh, religious life? Oh, that's great. Uh, the women's religious life is fantastic, uh, particularly the contemplative uh, life. Hmm. Uh, has it been a reborn? Or has it been a kept all along? Well, um, we had some strange laws in Sweden. So, uh, until 1980s or something, you needed royal permission to open a monastery. And there's only one legal monastery in the whole country, and that was uh, uh, the uh, sisters, Carmel sisters, who um, um, started a Carmel down in the southwest of Sweden with permission from, uh, from, from mm. uh, His Majesty, which meant the government, basically. And um, since then, um, and before then, there were illegally uh, um, uh, monasteries or nunneries or mm. convents of uh, Bridgerton sisters. Bridgerton, yeah. uh, they came in the 19... 20s, I think, for one of those um, big meetings. And um, they had invited officially the Swedish-born convert, uh, now blessed, uh, Elisabeth Hesselblad, who uh, refounded a, a part of the Bridgerton order that had almost been dying out, s existed in the old version, but mm -hmm. she did a refounding of it, a little bit more open for, for receiving guests and things like that. And um, she was invited f uh, to Sweden, and she brought three sisters with her. And when she left, she le she left the three in Sweden, and they call them. She's running a resting home. <laughs> <laughs> so they were underground yes. religious. Okay, very contemplative. Very uh, contemplative. <laughs> but but it's doing well though today. Yes, I think so. I mean, uh, the, we have opened not long ago was a whole convent of Lutheran Benedictine sisters. Or actually, they were not Benedictine then. Lutheran sisters who had found that their vocation was to be Benedictine sisters in the Catholic Church. Mm. They have subsequently built a beautiful monastery. Uh, it looked like sort of from Bavaria somewhere, uh, uh, traditional style. Uh, there was another such group. Uh, the Carmel has uh, divided itself, you know, made foundations elsewhere in Denmark. And there are Franciscans? Yeah. There are all, all kinds of Franciscan brothers, uh, all, all sorts of them. Uh, not many, though. Um, there's one, uh, uh, but they are there primarily foreign uh, okay. uh, um, vocations. Okay, but you also mentioned that you were greatly influenced by a Jesuit. Right? Yes, and they are doing very well too. The two main ma male religious orders doing well is the Dominicans and Jesuits. Okay. They have. Uh, Good, and also Dominican sisters, I forgot them. They have lots of vocations too. Uh, All right. good. Well, it's good to hear. Good to hear. Let's take our next caller, Barbara from New Jersey. Hello, Barbara. What's your question? I have a question. Um, <coughs> I'm a secular Franciscan, and um, my question is when you first converted to the Catholic Church, what was the reaction of your family? And when they heard you were going to become a priest, what was their reaction then? And how did you deal with it? God bless you both, and I'll take my response over the year. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, as regards the first question, my family, uh, when I converted, uh, I wouldn't say they were supportive, but nor were they uh, against it. They, they just didn't understand it, I would say. Mm. Uh, my mother put together a nice little reception for everyone, and uh, she rather liked that, and uh, she rather, I think, uh, liked the uh, uh, interest that many people showed in her. I said, oh, you're his his mother and so forth. Uh, <laughs> when I decided to become a priest, um, uh, they didn't like it at all. They th my mother thought it was her failure. Uh, uh, and my dad... It was my diplomat's son. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. I, I, I leveled the road by saying I was going to come, become a teacher first. For two years I said that. And, and that um, was the lowest on my mother's social ladder. So a <laughs> priest was slightly better. <laughs> all right. Well, let's take a, another break, and we'll come back in just a moment with a couple final thoughts with, from Father Tobias. See you in a bit.